Welcome to Craftlet, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from my corner of the Sonoran Desert, the Old Pueblo, Tucson, Arizona. Episode 190, a present for me. This episode of Craft Lit is brought to you by Knitting Out Loud. Listen while you knit. You can find the entire Knitting Out Loud catalog at www.knittingoutloud.com. Also, Knit Circus Magazine, featuring three rings of knitting, sewing, and fun. You can find out more about Knit Circus at www.knitcircus.com and Scribe Tutor, the online tutorial service offering you convenient writing help for writers of all ages. You can find out more at scribetutor.com. Hello, welcome back to the second part of A Christmas Carol. Very exciting stuff. Today we are doing stave three. This is the Ghost of Christmas Present. And, you know, last time we did a whole lot on Dickens and kind of history of the things that were affecting Charles Dickens as he was writing this book. But today we really just need to go over a couple of things that get mentioned in the book version of A Christmas Carol that I don't actually remember being mentioned in the movies. I've said before that the George C. George C. Scott version and Alistair Sims versions both did pretty well. Alistair Sims, I think, is the creepier of the two. And uh, and George C. Scott, I know they, they actually lifted quite a bit of the dialogue out of the text. However, and admittedly, it's been a while since I've seen the movie, I don't remember a couple of things being focused on or maybe explained quite as clearly as it needs to be. So the first thing I wanted to go over is a scene that goes by rather quickly, uh, a conversation that goes by rather quickly between Scrooge and the spirit. Scrooge says something about closing places, and it sounds like he's talking about places to eat on every seventh day. And he accuses the spirit of depriving poor people of their means of dining. Now, this sounded very odd to me, and I, I listened to it over and over again, and I was not able to parse the language. It wasn't a language problem, you know, like they were using archaic language or anything. It's the fact that this has gone out of, well, it, it's, it's just not done anymore. This was Sabbatarianism. This was the Christian doctrine of observing the Sunday as a holy day and reserving it only for worship. Now, this is something Dickens didn't like because what it meant is there would be no merrymaking, no open restaurants, no open stores on Sunday. And most people were looking at a six and sometimes seven day work week. So the only day they could possibly have gone out and had a meal or bought food fresh in the morning or anything like that, they were kept away from doing it. Now, Dickens' own feeling was that this this particular uh, law was the, the upper class people kind of restricting the lower classes and claiming that it was religious, but, but really it was just another way to keep the poor in their place. Now, whether that's true or not, you, you know, buy me a time machine and I'll be happy to tell you, but for the purposes of our story, once Scrooge brings this up, you need to listen very closely to how the spirit responds, because that voice is Dickens. And you know, that's that's one of the interesting things about having a, a narrator in a book is it's very easy for us to assume that the narrator is the author. Like uh, Mark Twain is often accused of being Huck Finn. And so all of the things that come out of Huck Finn's mouth that are ignorant or racist are things that are ascribed to Mark Twain, when in fact, he has written a very unreliable narrator who has been taught these things by society, that these things that Mark Twain didn't agree with. And he's using that character as a tool. Well, here we have a different case where Dickens is using, at least in this instance, the, the voice of the spirit of Christmas present 
to speak out against a practice that he felt was wrong and damaging to the population, especially to the poor. And of course, as we learned before, he had a great affinity for uh, trying to help help the poor. The other thing is, um, you'll hear a reference to a 15 bob um, income that Bob Cratchit earns. Cockney slang for a shilling was, was a bob. <laughs> so, you know, 15 bob is 15 shillings. Um, for Mr. Cratchit at the time, there is a uh, reason to believe that that amount of money was the entire cost of the Christmas feast. Seven shillings for the goose, five for the pudding, three for the onion, sage, and oranges. That is a lot if you can imagine taking an entire week's wages and putting them towards one meal. You know, he's saving up for that all year long. A couple of other things to go over before we start. Uh, you'll talk, you'll hear an, in the Cratchit home, you will hear them talking about Peter, uh, Peter Cratchit, going out and getting the goose. You'll also hear talk about him being in his collars. Okay, these are two things, two different things. One, let's deal with the collar first. If you recall the costume or the, the clothes that men wore at this time, they had those high starched collars that were split in the middle. So you'd have a, um, not a tie tack, but a, a button stud that would hold the collar together. It was not attached to the shirt. This is where you get those collarless shirts that are just the, the little tabs at the top and a high button at the top. And then they would wear these these collars uh, tabbed over. Usually there was a buttonhole on the back of the shirt that you would put another stud in. So you'd connect the collar to the shirt in the front and in the back. Okay. So this is, this is the very high split collar. And Peter is wearing one of the hand-me-downs from his father. So you can only imagine how threadbare that poor little thing is. The other thing is Peter is going out to get the goose because poor people didn't have ovens. They could cook over a fireplace and they could roast something on a spit, but that would preclude there from being stuffing. The goose that the Cratchits have is full of stuffing and that means it had to be cooked elsewhere. Now obviously on Christmas time you would not expect any food shops to be open but bakers would often open their hearths to the poor and being good and generous people they would have the um, the poor people pay them a little bit of money and they would cook their gooses their geese <laughs> cook their gooses and they would cook the geese for the poor people. So that is how the Cratchits wind up with a roast goose on their Christmas table. The last thing to go over with uh, before we play the audio of the book is what happens at the end of the Ghost of Christmas Present, uh, at the end of his scene. You may recall that there are two children, very thin, sad, dirty, morose looking children, hidden underneath the folds of the spirit's uh, gown. The, the big dressing gown, the gr big green robe that he's wearing. Listen to what Scrooge notices, because these children are not cute, sad-looking waifs, much like my son looks like on the front of the Cratchit pattern that's part of this uh, Dickensian blog hop. No, these, these children are barely children. Listen to that description, but also know that this uh, image of this personified image of the danger of ignorance and want was also something that was very close to Dickens' heart. Um, he was very worried that all these poor children, because there were many, because what else do you do for recreation if you have no money, not to put too fine a point on it, lots and lots of children living in poverty. Those children were not going to school. They couldn't afford to go to school. And, uh, and of course, their families needed them to work. As you see with the Cratchit family, the children are working. One of the things that Charles Dickens was in favor of was uh, ragged schools. These were schools that were set up by churches that provided a religious education to poor children. So, you know, they'd learn how to read a little and write a little, but mostly it was a religious education. Well, Dickens wasn't thrilled with the religious education side of it, but it was a school and the children were learning how to read and write some. It, listen to what he says about the boy at the end. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful line. And I don't recall, of all of the Christmas carols that I've seen, I 
do not recall the ghost of Christmas present being as harsh with Scrooge as he is in the actual book. And again, a lot of this is because for Dickens, the problems that they see in the world, in the present, are the problems that Dickens himself was up in arms about and quite angry about. Absolutely true here with uh, ignorance and want at the end of this particular stave. Uh, interestingly, it, uh, compulsory education for children in general didn't happen until 1870, which is when Dickens died. I'm going to link to a site for you uh, from which I have gleaned a lot of this information. I, I generally do my research in a bunch of different places, but I did come across a really fabulous page, David Perdue's Charles Dickens page, where he has, you know, a little summary of the plot and stuff. But one of the reasons why I wanted to link to this, aside from the fact that you'll see a lot of, a lot of the same art that we've been talking about and, um, and some of the, the background where, where he links to the sources where he's gotten this information from, is he has a couple of books that he's linked to as well, and information on where various movies were shot, and also links to the movie versions of the book, in case you are so inclined and feel that you would like to go purchase one. Uh, it'll make it easy for you because there is a wealth of information located all in one place. So I will be including that for you in the show notes, which you can find as part of this Dickens blog hop. And I think that's it. I think now it is time for us to listen to A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Stave three, the second of the three spirits. Awakening in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told what bell it was again upon the stroke of one. He felt he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time, for the especial purpose of holding a conference with the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains the new spectre would drop back, he put them every one aside with his own hands, and lying down again established a sharp lookout all round the bed. For he wished to challenge the spirit in the moment of its appearance, and did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. Gentlemen of the free and easy sort, who plume themselves on being acquainted with a move or two, and being usually equal to the time of day, express the wide range of their capacity for adventure by observing that they are good for anything from pitch and toss to manslaughter, between which opposite extremes, no doubt, there lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of subjects. Without venturing for Scrooge quite as handily as this, I don't mind in calling on you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of strange appearances, and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing, and consequently, when the bell struck one, and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All this time he lay upon his bed, the very core and center of a blaze and ruddy light, which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, at which, being only light, was more alarming than a dozen ghosts, as he was powerless to make out what it meant, or would be at, and was sometimes apprehensive that he might be at the very moment an interesting case of spontaneous combustion, without having the consolation of knowing it. At last, however, he began to think, as you and I would have thought at first, for it is always the person not in the predicament who knows what ought to have been done in it, and would unquestionably have done it too. At last, I say, he began to think that the source and secret of his ghostly light might be in the adjoining room, from whence, on further tracing it, it seemed to shine. This idea, taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by his name, and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room, there was no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright, gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there. 
and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of a heart that never known in Scrooge's time or Marley's, or for many and many a winter season gone, heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne where turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch and shaped not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up high up to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. "'Come in!' exclaimed the ghost. "'Come in and know me better, man!' Scrooge entered timidly, and hung his head before this spirit. It was not the dogged Scrooge he had been, and though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. "'I am the ghost of Christmas present,' said the spirit. "'Look upon me!' Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple green robe or mantle, bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capricious breast was bare, as if disdaining to be watered or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore no other covering than a holly wreath, set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eyes, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girded around its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. "'You have never seen the like of me before!' exclaimed the spirit. "'Never,' Scrooge made answer to it. "'Have never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning, for I am very young, my elder brothers born in these later years,' pursued the phantom. "'I don't think I have,' said Scrooge. I'm afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? More than eighteen hundred, said the ghost. A tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, said Scrooge submissively, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told, and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, pigs, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings, fruit, and punch, all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning, where, for weather was severe, the people made a rough but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music in scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings, and from the tops of their houses, whence it was mad delight to the boys to see it come plumping down into the road and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked black enough, and the windows blacker, contrasting with the smooth white sheet of snow upon the roofs, and with the dirty snow upon the ground, which last deposited had been ploughed up in deep furrows by the heavy wheels of carts and wagons, furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times, where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels, hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy, and the shortest streets were choked up with a dingy mist, half-thawed, half-frozen, whose heavier particles descended in a shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had by but one consent caught fire, and were blazing away to their dear heart's content. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate or the town, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad, that the clearest summer air and brightest summer sun might have endeavoured to diffuse in vain. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the parapets, and now and then exchanging a facetious snowball, better-natured missile far than many a wordy jest, laughing heartily as it went right, or less heartily if it went wrong. <laughs> the poulterers' shops were still half open, and the fruiters' 
were radiant in their glory. There were great, round, pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts, shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling at the doors, and tumbling out into the street in their apoplectic opulence. There were ruddy, brown-faced, broad-girthed Spanish onions, shining in the fatness of their growth like Spanish friars, and wigging from their shelves in wanton slyness at the girls as they went by, and glanced demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids. There were bunches of grapes made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance, ancient walks among the woods, and pleasant shufflings ankle-deep through withered leaves. There were Norfolk biffins, squat and swarthy, setting off the yellow of the oranges and lemons, and, in the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in brown paper bags and eaten after dinner. The very gold and silver fish set forth among these choice fruits in a bowl, though members of a dull and stagnant-blooded race, appeared to know there was something going on, and to a fish went gasping round and round in their little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers, oh, the grocers, nearly closed, with perhaps two shutters down, or one, but through those gaps such glimpses. It was not alone that the scales descending on the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller departed company so briskly, or that the canisters were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose, or even the raisins were so plentiful and rare, the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sugar as to make the coldest lookers-on feel faint and subsequently bilious. Nor was it that the figs were moist and pulpy, or that the French plums blushed in modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes, or that everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress, but the customers were all so hurried and so eager in their hopeful promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the door, crashing their wicker baskets wildly and left their purchases upon the counter and came running back to fetch them and committed hundreds of the like mistakes in the best humor possible while the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that the polished hearts in which they fastened their aprons behind might have been their own worn outside for general inspection and for christmas doors to peck at if they choose but soon the steeples called good people all to church and chapel, and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes, and with their gayest faces. And at the time there emerged from scores of by-streets, lanes, and nameless turnings, innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revellers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in a baker's doorway, and taking off the covers, as their bearers passed, sprinkled incense on the dinners from his torch. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice, when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humor was restored directly, for they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day, and so it was, God love it, so it was. In time the bells ceased, and the bakers were shut up, and yet there was a general shadowing forth of all these dinners in the progress of their cooking, in the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven, where the pavement smoked as if its stones were cooking too. "'Is there a peculiar flavor in which you sprinkle from your torch?' asked Scrooge. "'There is. My own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day?' asked Scrooge. "'To any kindly given. To a poor one most.' "'Why a poor one most?' asked Scrooge. "'Because it needs it most.' "'Spirit,' said Scrooge, after a moment's thought, "'I wonder you, of all the beings in the many worlds about us, "'should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment.' "'I?' cried the Spirit. "'You would deprive them of all their means of dining every seventh day, "'often the only day in which they can be said to dine at all,' said Scrooge, "'wouldn't you?' I? cried the spirit. You seek to choose these places on the seventh day, said Scrooge, and it comes to the same thing. I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Forgive me if I am wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to know us, and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill-will, 
hatred, envy, bigotry, and self-righteousness in our name, who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin, as if they had never lived. Remember that, and charge the doings on themselves, not us. Scrooge promised that he would, and they went on invisible, as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully and like a supernatural creature as it was possible that he could have done in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all poor men that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. For there he went, and took Scrooge with him, holding to his robe, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the twinkling of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-room house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt-collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honour of the day into his mouth rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they had smelt the goose, and known it for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table, and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, though his colours nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly in the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. "'What has ever got your precious father, then?' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'And your brother, Tiny Tim. And Martha weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour.' "'Here's Martha, mother,' said a girl, appearing as she spoke. "'Here's Martha, mother,' cried the two young Cratchits. "'Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha!' "'Why, bless your heart, alive, my dear, how late you are,' said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times, and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her with officious zeal. "'We had a deal of work to finish up last night,' replied the girl, "'and had to clear away this morning, mother. "'Well, never mind, so long as you've come,' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'Sit ye down by the fire, my dear,' and have a warm, Lord bless ye. No, no, father's coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive to the fringe, hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes donned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas, for Tiny Tim he bore a little crutch, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. "'Not coming,' said Bob, with a sudden declension of his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood-horse all the way from church, and he had come home rampant. "'Not coming upon Christmas Day!' Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only in joke, so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash-house, that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. "'And how did little Tim behave?' asked Mrs. Cratchit, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. "'As good as gold,' said Bob, "'and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me coming home that he had hoped people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see.' Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire, and while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round, and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose was the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon, for which a black swan was a matter of course, and in truth it was something very like it in that house. 
Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy already beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be held. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause, as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all round the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife, and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe that there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness, were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by apple sauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet every one had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular was steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to hear witnesses to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it had not been done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have gotten over the wall over the backyard and stolen it. While well, they were merry with the goose, a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other, with a laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered flushed, but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing with half of half a quartern of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, what a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess that she hadn't had doubts about the quality of the flour. Everyone had something to say about it, for nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been flat heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept and the fire made up, the compound in the jug was being tasted, and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table, and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire, and then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth, in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half a one, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks, while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, every one, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon the stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his, as if he loved the child and he wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he had never felt before, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no, kind spirit. Say he will be spared. "'If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race,' returned the ghost, "'will find him here. "'What then? "'If he be like to die, you'd better do it, and decrease the surplus population.' "'Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit, "'and was overcome with penitence and grief. "'Man,' said the ghost, "'if man you be at heart, not adamant, Forbear that wicked count until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live and what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Oh, God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust!
Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke, and trembling cast his eyes upon the ground, but he raised them speedily upon hearing his own name. "'Mr. Scrooge,' said Bob, "'I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of our feast.' "'The founder of our feast, indeed,' cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. "'I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and hope he'd have a good appetite for it.' "'My dear,' said Bob, "'the children, Christmas Day?' "'It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure,' said she, "'in which one drinks the help of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. "'You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow.' "'My dear,' was Bob's mild answer, "'Christmas Day.' "'I'll drink his health for your sake in the day,' said Mrs. Cratchit, "'but not for his. Long life to him. A merry Christmas and a happy New Year. he would be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt.' The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings, which had no heartiness. Tiny Tim drank last of all, but he didn't get twopence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow upon the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, and the mere relief of Scrooge the bail for being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favour when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a stretch, and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest, tomorrow being a holiday she passed at home, and how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child travelling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty, and Peter might have known, and very likely did the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful pleased with one another and contented with the time, and when they faded they looked happier yet. In the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim until the last. By this time it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily. As Scrooge and the spirit went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires in kitchens, parlors, and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. Here the flickering of the blaze showed preparations for a cozy dinner, with hot plates baking through and through before the fire, and deep red curtains ready to be drawn to shut out the cold and darkness. There are all the children in the house are running out in the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, aunts, and to be the first to greet them. Here again were shadows on the window blind of guests assembling, and there a group of handsome girls, all hooded and fur-booted, and all chattering at once, tripped lightly off to some near neighbor's house, where woe upon the single man who saw them enter, artful witches, well they knew it, in a glow. But if you were judged from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings, you might have thought that no one was home to give them welcome when they got there. Instead of every house expecting company and piling up its fires half chimney high, blessings on it how the ghost exalted, how it bared its breath of breast, and opened its capricious palm and floated on, outpouring with a generous hand its bright and harmless mirth on everything within its reach. The very lamplight ran on before, dotting the dusky street with specks of light, and who was dressed to spend the evening somewhere, laughed out loudly as the spirit passed, though he had kenned the lamplighter that he had any company but Christmas. And now, without a word of warning from the ghost, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor, where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about, as though it were the burial place of giants, and water spread itself wherever it listed, or would have done so, but for the frost that held it prisoner, and nothing grew but moss and furs and coarse rank grass. Down in the west the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red which glared upon the desolation for an instant like a sullen eye, and frowning lower, lower, lower yet, was lost in the thick gloom of darkest night. "'What place is this?' asked Scrooge. 
"'A place where miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth,' returned the spirit. "'But they know me. See!' A light shone from the window of a hut, and swiftly they advanced towards it, passing through the wall of mud and stone. They found a cheerful company assembled around a glowing fire. An old, old man and woman, with their children and their children's children, and another generation beyond that, all decked out gaily in their holiday attire. The old man, in a voice that seldom rose above the howling wind upon the barren waste, was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very old song when he was a boy, and from time to time they all joined in in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man got quite blithe and loud, and so surely as they stopped, his vigor sank again. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold his robe, and passing on above the moor, sped whither, not to see, to see. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land, a frightful rage of rocks behind him, and his ears were deafened by the thundering of water as it rolled and roared and raged among the dreadful caverns it had worn, and scarcely tried to undermine the earth. Built upon a dismal reef of sunken rocks, some league or so from shore, on which the waters chafed and dashed the wild ear through, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of seaweed clung to its base, and storm-birds, born of the wind one might suppose as seaweed of the water, rose and fell about it like the waves they skimmed. But even there, two men who watched the light had made a fire, and through the loophole of the thick stone wall shed out a ray of brightness in the awful sea. Joining their horny hands over a rough table at which they sat, they wished each other Merry Christmas in their can of grog, and one of them, the elder too, with his face all damaged and scarred with hard weather as a figure of an old ship might be, struck up a sturdy song that was like a gale in itself. Again the ghost sped on, above the black and heaving sea, on, on, until being far away, as he told Scrooge, from any shore, they lighted on a ship. They stood beside the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the officers who had the watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations, but every man among them hummed a Christmas tune, or had a Christmas thought, or spoke below his breath to his companion of some bygone Christmas day, with homeward hopes belonging to it. And every man on board, waking or sleeping, good or bad, had had a kinder word for another on that day than on any day in the year, and they had shared to some extent in their festivities, and had remembered those he cared for at a distance, and had known that they delighted to remember him. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while listening to the moaning of the wind, and thinking what a solemn thing it was to move on through a lonely darkness over an unknown abyss, whose depths were secrets as profound as death. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while thus engaged, to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with the spirit standing smiling by his side, and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. Ha, ha, laughed Scrooge's nephew. Ha, ha, ha. If you should happen by any unlikely chance to know a man more blessed in a laugh than Scrooge's nephew, all I can say is, I should like to know him too. Introduce him to me, and I'll cultivate his acquaintance. It is a fair, even-hand, noble adjustment of things, that there is infection in disease and sorrow. There is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides, rolling his head, and twisting his face into the most extravagant contortions, Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, not being a bit behindhand, roared out lustily, Ha, 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 He said that Christmas was a humbug as I live, said Scrooge's nephew. He believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women, they never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed to be made to be kissed, as no doubt it was, all kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking, you know, but satisfactory, too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, but not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him.
"'I'm sure he's very rich, Fred,' hinted Scrooge's niece. "'At least you always tell me so.' "'What of that, my dear?' said Scrooge's nephew. "'His wealth is of no use to him. "'He don't do any good with it. "'He don't make himself comfortable with it. "'He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking <laughs> "'that he is ever going to benefit us with it.' "'I have no patience with him,' observed Scrooge's niece. "'Scrooge's niece's sisters and all the other ladies "'expressed the same opinion. "'Oh, I have,' said Scrooge's nephew. "'I'm sorry for him. "'I couldn't be angry with him if I tried.' "'Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself always. "'Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, "'and he won't come and dine with us. "'What's the consequence? "'He don't lose much of a dinner.' "'Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner,' "'interrupted Scrooge's niece. "'Everyone else said the same, "'and they must be allowed to have been competent judges "'because they had all just had dinner, "'and, with the dessert upon the table, "'were clustered round the fire by lamplight. "'Well, I'm very glad to hear it,' said Scrooge's nephew, "'because I haven't great faith in these young housekeepers. "'What do you say, Topper?' Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, "'for he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast, "'who had no right to express an opinion on the subject, "'whereas Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, "'not the one with the roses, blushed. "'Do go on, Fred,' said Scrooge's niece, clapping her hands. "'He never finishes what he begins to say. "'He is such a ridiculous fellow.' "'Scrooge's nephew reveled in another laugh, "'and as it was impossible to keep the infection off, "'though the plump sister tried hard to do it with an aromatic vinegar, "'his example was unanimously followed. "'I was only going to say,' said Scrooge's nephew, "'that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us "'and not making merry with us is, as I think, "'that he loses some pleasant moments which could do him no harm. "'I am sure he loses pleasanter comparisons "'than he can find in his own thoughts, "'either in his mouldy old office or his dusty chambers. "'I mean to give him the same chance every year, "'whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. "'He may rail at Christmas till he dies, "'but I can't help thinking better of it. "'I defy him.' If he finds me going there in good temper year after year, and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk fifty pounds, that's something. And I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of shaking Scrooge, but being thoroughly good-natured and not caring much what they laughed at, so that they laughed at any rate, he encouraged them in their merriment and passed the bottle joyously. After tea they had some music, for they were a musical family and knew what they were about when they sung a glee or catch, I can assure you, especially Topper, who would growl away in the bass like a good one and never swell the large veins in his forehead or get rid in the face over it. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp, and played, among other tunes, a simple little air, a mere nothing, you might learn to whistle it in two minutes, which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school, as he had been reminded by the ghost of Christmas past. When this strain of music sounded, all the things the ghost had shown him came upon his mind. He softened more and more, and thought if he could listen to it often years ago, he might have cultivated the kindness of life for his own happiness with his own hands, without resorting to the sexton spade that buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while they played forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better at Christmas when its mighty founder was a child himself. Stop. There was first a game at Blind Man's Bluff. Of course there was. And I no more believe Topper was really blind than I believe he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is that it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew, and that the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went after that plump sister in the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature, knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over chairs, bumping against the piano, smothered himself among the curtains. Wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anybody else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did on purpose, he would have made a feint of endeavouring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding, and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. She often cried out it wasn't fair, it really was not. But when at last he caught her, when, in spite of all her silken rustlings and rapid flutterings past him, he got her into a corner whence there was no escape, then his conduct was the most execrable, for his pretending not to know her, his pretending that it was necessary to touch her headdress, and further to assure himself of her identity by pressing a certain ring upon her finger, and a certain chain about her neck was vile, monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it, when 
another blind man being in office, there were so many confidential together behind the curtains. Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind man's bluff party, but made comfortable with a large chair and a footstool in a snug corner, where the ghost and Scrooge were close behind her. But she joined in the forfeits, and loved her love to admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. Likewise, at the game of how, when, and where, she was very great, and to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew beat her sisters hollow, though they were sharp girls, too, as Topple would have told you. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge, for wholly forgetting in the interest he had in what was going on, that his voice made no sound in their ears, he sometimes came out with his guess quite loud, and very often guessed quite right, too, for the sharpest needle, best white chapel, warranted not to cut in the eye, was not sharper than Scrooge, blunt as he took it in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood, and looked upon him with such favor that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guests departed. But this, the spirit said, could not be done. "'Here's a new game,' said Scrooge. "'One half-hour spirit, only one.' It was a game called Yes or No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what, he only answering to their questions yes or no, as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal— a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes, and lived in London, and walked about in the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, and didn't live in a menagerie, and was never killed in a market, and it was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter, and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get off off the sofa and stamp. At last the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, "'I found it! I know what it is! Fred, I know what it is!' "'What is it?' said Fred. "'It's your Uncle Scrooge!' "'Which it certainly was!' Admiration was the universal sentiment, though some objected that the reply to, Is it a bear, ought to have been yes, inasmuch as an answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted their thoughts from Mr. Scrooge, supposing they had never had any tendency that way. He has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, said Fred, and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of mulled wine ready to our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried. "'A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, wherever he is,' said Scrooge's nephew. "'He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge!' Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an inaudible speech if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew— and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient with their greater hope, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, in misery's every refuge, where vain man and his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out. He left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it were only a night, but Scrooge had his doubts about this, because Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into a space of time they passed together. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it, until they had left a children's twelfth-night party, when, looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed that his hair was grey. "'A spirit's life so short?' asked Scrooge. "'My life upon this globe is very brief,' replied the ghost. "'It ends to-night.' "'To-night?' cried Scrooge. "'To-night at midnight. Hark! The time is drawing near.' The chimes were ringing three quarters past eleven at the moment. "'Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask,' said Scrooge, looking intently at the spirit's robe. "'But I see something strange, and not belonging to yourself, protruding from your skirts. 
Is that a foot or a claw? It might be a claw, for the flesh there is upon it, was the spirit's sorrowful reply. Look here. From the foldings of his robe he brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at his feet and clung upon the outside of his garment. Oh, man, look here, look, look down here, exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and girl, yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate, too, in their humility, where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints. A stale and shriveled hand, like that of age, had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked and glared out menacing. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity in any grade, through all the mysteries of wonderful creation, has monsters half so horrible in dread. Scrooge started back appalled. Having them shown to him in this way, he tried to say they were fine children, but the words choked themselves, rather than be parties to a lie of such enormous magnitude. Spirit, are they yours? Scrooge could say no more. They are man's, said the spirit, looking down upon them, and they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. The boy is ignorance, the girl is want. Beware them both, in all of their degree, but most of all beware the boy, for on his brow I see written which is doom, unless the writing be erased. Deny it, cried the spirit, stretching out his hand towards the city. Slander those who tell it ye, omit it for your facetious purposes, and make it worse, and bide the end. Have they no refuge or resource? cried Scrooge. Are there no prisons? said the spirit, turning on him for the last time with his own words. Are there no workhouses? The bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. Good place to end for the day. Our next episode of this special podcast will be staves four and five, the last two staves of A Christmas Carol. Interesting changes in the book, no? Um, not changes in the book, but changes that they make to the movie. They only focus on people who have specific connections to Scrooge, the Cratchits and Fred. But here, you saw miners, you saw sailors. Scrooge saw a lot more merriment happening, and always in places that one would assume people had no call to be merry, because life was hard. And... Why spend your hard-earned money on one day? I hope you enjoyed having a chance to actually listen to Dickens' words. I also thought it was very interesting how much time he spent describing Christmas Day and the way the festivities were brought together and all of the different pieces. You know, this is how historians can find out bits and pieces about just normal people's days. This is the stuff that nobody bothered to write down in, you know, historical tomes because this was just what everyone did. Just like we would never think to write down how to dial a phone with an old turn dial. But now that those kind of dials are gone, at some point people are going to wonder, you know, why do we call it dialing a phone when we're just pushing buttons? It's the same kind of thing. You don't think about it while you're in the middle of it. It's only after that it starts to carry some kind of importance. And along with that, did you notice that Scrooge was still using financial terminology to discuss his time with the spirit? It was, all right, spirit, I may profit by what you tell me. You know, he's still, it's, it's like um, people who watch sports a lot only ever speak in sports analogies. It's the same kind of thing. Really, Scrooge is only anything, any, you know, frame of reference or piece that is interesting to him is all financial. And again, very sad because as Fred says so wisely, it doesn't bring him a bit of joy. It's just this kind of obsession. And of course, it's going to take quite a lot to knock him out of that world. But we are about to see exactly 
what it's going to take. So on that note, I leave you until our next episode of the special edition of Craft Lit's Christmas Carol. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon.